Hi, welcome to our final online midweek worship service during this Lenten season. Tonight we remember the trial of Jesus. We'll look at the principal characters involved. And maybe as we examine the trial, we might even see ourselves in it. We're glad that you're here. We want to remind you that we will have an online service this Sunday at 9 a.m., uh, Palm Sunday, as a matter of fact, we invite you to join us uh, on any of the platforms that we offer, our uh, website, also Facebook and YouTube. Uh, check any one of those to catch the service at 9 o'clock. And if you miss it at 9, it will be there for you to watch later on. I want to thank those who are assisting today, including uh, Jackie McDuffie, who is signing for our deaf community, Dan Seabreeze, who is our producer and editor, and Todd Bradowski, who helps out with the sound and also our PowerPoints. We're glad to be able to bring this service to you today, and we pray that God will bless us together as we worship him. begin with the invocation. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. St. John wrote, If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just, and will forgive our sins, and purify us from all righteousness. We confess our sins to God our Father. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love. According to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. 
wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is always before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight so that you are proved right when you speak and justified when you judge. Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Surely you desire truth in the inner parts. You teach me wisdom in the inmost place. Clean me with hyssop, and I will be clean. Wash me, and I will be whiter than snow. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us, and for his sake, God forgives us all our sins. As a servant of the word, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all of your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We now sing our next hymn. The Old Testament reading for this evening comes from Isaiah, chapter 61, verses 1 through 3. The Spirit of God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to grant to those who mourn in Zion, to give them a beautiful headdress instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the garment of praise instead of a faint spirit, that they may be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. Our epistle lesson tonight comes from Romans chapter 12, verses 9 through 21. Let love be genuine. Abhor what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not be slothful in zeal. Be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation. Be constant in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight. Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, Give him something to drink, for by doing so, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, 
but overcome evil with good. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel tonight comes to us from St. Luke, chapter 22, verse 63, reading through to chapter 3, verses 25. Now the men who were holding Jesus in custody were mocking him as they beat him. They also blindfolded him and kept asking, Prophesy, who is it that struck you? And they said many other things against him, blaspheming him. When the day came, the assembly of the elders of the people gathered together, both the chief priest and the scribes. And they led him away to their council and said, If you are the Christ, tell us. But he said to them, If I tell you, you will not believe. And if I ask you, you will not answer. But from now on, the Son of Man shall be seated at the right hand of the power of God. So they all said, you are the Son of God then? And he said to them, You say that I am. Then they said, What further testimony do we need? We have heard it ourselves from his own lips. Then the whole company of them arose and brought him before Pilate. And they began to accuse him, saying, We found this man misleading our nation and forbidding us to give our tribute to Caesar and saying that he himself is Christ, a king. And Pilate asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? And he answered him, You have said so. Then Pilate said to the chief priest and the crowds, I find no guilt in this man. But they were urgent, saying, He serves up the people, teaching throughout all Judea, from Galilee, even to this place. When Pilate heard this, he asked whether the man was a Galilean. And when he learned that he belonged to Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him over to Herod, who was himself in Jerusalem at that time. When Herod saw Jesus, he was very glad, because he had long desired to see him, because he had heard about him, and he was hoping to see some sign done by him. So he questioned him at some length, but he made no answer. The chief priest and the scribes stood by, vehemently, vehemently accusing him. And Herod with his soldiers treated him with contempt and mocked him. Then, arraying him in splendid clothes, he sent him back to Pilate. And Herod and Pilate became friends with each other that very day, for before they had been at enmity with each other. Pilate then called together the chief priest and the rulers and the people and said to them, You brought me this man as one who was misleading the people. And after examining him before you, behold, I did not find this man guilty of any of your charges against him. Neither did Herod, for he sent him back to us. Look, nothing deserving death has been done by him. I will therefore punish and release him. But they all cried out together, Away with this man, and release to us Barnabas, a man who had been thrown into, into prison for an insurrection started in the city and for murder. Pilate addressed them once more, desiring to release Jesus, but they kept shouting, Crucify! Crucify him! A third time he said to them, Why? What evil has he done? I have found in him no guilt deserving death, Therefore I will punish and release him. But they were urgent, demanding with loud cries that he should be crucified, and their voices prevailed. So Pilate decided that their demand should be granted. He released the man who had been thrown into prison for insurrection and murder, for whom they asked, but he delivered Jesus over to their will. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. We continue now with the sermon hymn.
Grace and peace to you from God our Father and from Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. My dear sweet wife and I are big fans of the courtroom drama Bull. We liked Michael Weatherly, the star of the program, when he was on NCIS, so we tuned in to see what it was all about. Um, Weatherly plays a court or a trial scientist, and the program has become must-see TV for Sherry and me. We wonder, will Bull be able to pick the right group of jurors that will be favorable to his client? Will he come up with the right strategy to defend the client? Will he be able to deal with the judge and his uh, decisions as they're made in the courtroom? My oldest daughter, who was once a county prosecutor and now is a presiding judge, told me that, Dad, these courtroom dramas are all fiction. They're not real. She said to me, very true a very few trials have those aha moments and no judge would allow the shenanigans that we normally see in a television courtroom drama. In real life, it's all straightforward and just the facts. And that's what makes Luke's telling of Jesus' trial so interesting. He began his gospel by telling his reader that he had carefully made an investigation of everything that had taken place in the life of Jesus. His goal, as he puts it, was to write an orderly account of the life, passion, death, and resurrection of Jesus. So when it comes to Jesus' trial, we would expect Luke to give us just the facts and nothing else. He uh, treats this uh, trial, though, in a way that's different from most of his account of the life of Jesus as you read through the gospel. In fact, the way Luke describes the trial makes it sound like it's ready to be a television courtroom drama. He gives us the people and their emotions. He tells us about the uh, -the behind-the-scenes activity that takes place during the trial. Now think about it for a moment. When Peter writes, or or when Luke writes about Peter's denial of Jesus, he gives us just the facts. He said, he describes that Peter was questioned three times by the people, and three times Peter gave an answer. He denied knowing Jesus. But if you were listening carefully as tonight's gospel lesson was read, you see something different. Peter gives us or Luke gives us the dramas that unfolds. For example, he tells us about the relationship with Herod and Pilate. He tells us that they used to be enemies, but after this experience, they become good friends. And Luke tells us about Herod, and the fact that what Herod is looking for is a show. He wants Jesus to perform some kind of miracle to, to wow him. And then when Jesus is returned to Pilate, Luke shares with us the motivation of the Roman judge. Because as far as Pilate's concerned, this is a nuisance. He just wants to give a decision and then be on his way. Pilate, in fact, is sympathetic to Jesus. He knows that the religious leaders are just jealous of Jesus. And then we've also got something else. We have the anger of the chief priests and teachers of the law. In fact, they are unrelenting in their insistence that Jesus be crucified and put to death. So Luke's description of this event is different than everything we've read up to this point. He describes the people who are calling for the death of Jesus, and maybe what he's doing as well is he wants us to see that we are a part of that crowd too. Imagine for a moment that you're standing at your kitchen window, you're watching your kids outside in the backyard playing, and then you notice your reflection in that window. And for a moment it takes you back to when you played in the backyard, when you had fun with the neighbor kids. You think about those days, and and they were good days. But still, maybe... Luke is helping us see 
that we're participants in the trial of Jesus too. Now, I know what you're thinking. That would never happen. I would never call for the crucifixion of Jesus. I would never, ever cry out for the crucifixion of an innocent man. But here's the point. The trial is not done to establish Jesus' innocence. Pilate has already declared that Jesus is innocent. What does the very last verse of our reading tell us? I hope you caught that because it says that Pilate gave Jesus over to their will. Now, what does a sinful world want? A sinful world, it wants the death of Jesus. We know that apart from God, our hearts are overcome by a strange, selfish, ever-changing will. The Apostle Paul tells us that we are enemies of God. And in the Lord's trial, we see how this is true. We see how the people have an ever-changing will about Jesus. When he comes into town, he is cheered as a conquering hero. But in less than a week, those hosannas turn into Crucify him, crucify him. Herod wants miracles, but ridicules the man when he won't perform for him. And Pilate just wants to barter some peace or or barter a decision with Jesus so that there will be peace in the city. The leaders of Israel no longer look to God, but they're depending on their Roman rulers who they hate to hand down a verdict that will be pleasing with him. Think about it. The Israel people, or the Israelites, have turned their back on God and his will for them. In this life, we live in a certain tension. We want to do God's will, on the one hand, but then we also want to carry out our own will as well. And it's a It's a tight rope between those two. For example, the Lord tells us that we are to be his witnesses. But when given the opportunity to tell another person about Jesus, do we do it? Or do we quickly change the subject? Do we talk about the weather or uh, uh, work or the football cardinals? Anything but talking about Jesus. Today we find it really easy to sit inside the church but it's really much harder to go outside and be the church. For example, inside the church, you're moved to give money to the poor because they need it. But outside the church, you're watching this television commercial about this new sport utility vehicle, and you begin imagining what you'd look like behind the wheel. And you can see yourself looking pretty cool, driving that that car to the envy of everyone else. You think for a moment about the appeal to help the poor people, but then you say to yourself, I have a right to own a good vehicle, and besides, it's my money. Or it's easy to be in church and to think about the idea of going on an overseas mission trip. But when the church asks you to go outside and be the church and take sandwiches and water to the poor who are living in a park all by themselves, you reason, that's really not being a missionary. You have to go overseas to be a missionary. I'll just wait until we can do that. Now, given what's happening in our country today, engaging people at work or or, uh, traveling out of the country to do mission work is out of the question. But still, there's that tension I'm talking about. Because on the one hand, you want to do what God commands, but on the other hand, your own will seems so much better for you. And what that amounts to is sin, pure and simple. Now remember, the trial is not the end of the story. In fact, when you're reading a story, you really need to get all the way to the end to understand what that story was really all about. And the same is true of this trial. At the end of Luke's gospel, Jesus comes to them and to the disciples, and he gives them a very special gift. Luke writes, Jesus opened their eyes so that they could understand the scriptures. 
Jesus told them, this is what is written. The Christ will suffer and rise from the dead on third day, on the third day, and repentance and forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. With these words, Jesus is revealing the truth about himself. And he is sharing with us that it was his Father's will that he would be the Savior of the world. It was the Father's will that he would take on the burden of the sins of the world and pay for them with his own blood. According to the Father's will, our salvation is then accomplished and death can no longer be a threat to us. And then in Luke, the final words of Jesus. These are the final words that, that Jesus says according to Luke's gospel. And they are, repentance and forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations beginning in Jerusalem. And that's the beauty of the gospel message. It gives us the assurance that our sins are truly forgiven and that heaven is our home. I love to hear those words, our sins are forgiven. And that's the wonder of absolution. That's why you heard the absolution again tonight. That you might receive the assurance that God holds nothing against you. He's forgiven you of your sins. Now, I have had people come to me a few times and have said, doesn't God get tired of hearing us confess the same things all over again? Well, the answer to that is no. In fact, Martin Luther wrote about confession in the small catechism. He wrote that confession has two parts. First, we confess our sins. And then second, we receive absolution. That is, forgiveness from the pastor as if from God himself. Not doubting, but firmly believing that by it our sins are forgiven by God in heaven. So when we confess our sins and we hear that word of absolution, they're the sweetest words that we can hear in all the worship service. Isaiah captures that feeling so well for us in chapter 1, verse 8. He says, come now, let us reason together. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are as red as crimson, they shall be like wool. So yeah, we can watch our favorite television courtroom drama whenever we want, but praise God that we will never stand in God's court to be sentenced. Through the forgiveness of sins, the only verdict that could be laid down for you and me is not guilty. And that is the grace and the love of God for you and me. Amen. May the peace of God that passes all understanding, keep our hearts and minds through faith in Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. In place of the Apostles' Creed, we are continuing to review the Catechism, and tonight our review is of the sixth petition of the Lord's Prayer. What is the sixth petition of the Lord's Prayer? Lead us not into temptation. What does this mean? God tempts no one. We pray in this petition that God would guard and keep us to the devil and our sinful nature and the world, that we may not be deceived or misled into false belief, despair, and other great shame or vice. Although we are attacked by these things, we pray that we finally might overcome them and win the victory. And now we continue with the responsive prayer and the Lord's Prayer. We pray. O Lord, our trials and troubles seem to be insignificant next to the trail you endured. We see the injustice, slander, and physical punishment administered to you, and we are ashamed and humbled, for you took what we deserved. 
Jesus, you could have called down legions of angels for protection and freedom, but instead you stood silently. All this you went through to secure our salvation. We praise and thank you, precious Savior. May we with grateful hearts cherish the preaching and teaching of repentance and forgiveness of sins. We receive comfort and hope in knowing that you, O Christ, have made us clean and new again. Son of God, your love is stronger than death and more powerful than sin. We live tonight and always in the light of your love. O give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endures forever. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And now receive the blessing of the Lord, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be and abide with you all. Amen. We now conclude with our final hymn. Thank you for tuning in tonight for our final midweek online worship service. We invite you to tune in on Sunday morning at 9 o'clock as we bring our Palm Sunday worship to you. Wherever God's word is proclaimed, God's people may worship. We thank you for joining us tonight, and may God continue to bless and keep you in his care.